Praise God. Hallelujah. Wow. What an adventure it can be. Just imagine, I mean, the, the potential adventure of God touching you and helping you grow and sending you into his harvest field and wow that was the spaceship landing in the, in the parking lot I believe thank you God bless you get seated and uh, be comfortable and uh, what you, how where are we how, how long are we doing this I'd like to just sit here and talk all no, that is going to happen so just whatever okay good I, th I think we're safe don't don't worry or anything and uh, hello I'm sorry okay but there's always a limit you know I had this <laughs> it wasn't a fear or anything or it really it wasn't a deep concern but as I was getting started on the way over here, I had this kind of dreadful thought that uh, wouldn't it be just great if you know, there's some horrendous blockage on Route 50 and I end up here late. <sighs> so, you know, you know, I would look around to turn and, you know, getting on the highway. They seem to be moving okay. So, thank God. I have a, uh, back in Indiana, I have a friend, a very good friend, and um, he's like a pal, okay? Um, his name is Flynn, but I've given him a nickname, and I, I call him Jelly Bean. And I call him Jelly Bean because he's black like licorice, and he's as sweet as candy. He, uh, we do a lot of things together, and uh, I met him in West Virginia. I met him on the side of the interstate at a rest stop in West Virginia. We had pulled in there, and he had, he had gotten a ride with somebody and pulled in there, and the next thing you know, he's in our vehicle, and he's driving back to Indiana with us, and uh, yeah, it's amazing. He, uh, the first night that he was with us, he, uh, he brought this cage with him, too. That's the th weird part. You know, when he got in the, in the Jeep, you know, we, there was also this cage that folded up and went in the Jeep with it. Oh, I didn't tell you. He's, he's our dog. And uh, so he jumps up in there, and um, anyway, it was amazing. I was, I was really looking forward to, you know, him moving in with us and everything. And then he got to the house, and he was wild. He just went wild. And uh, he was, you know, looking around for trouble. He was like walking around looking for trouble. And I was, you know, walking around with him, you know, looking to keep him out of trouble. And so, we, you know, we had this thing, that, you know, who's the alpha here? And... Uh, you know, he was going in there and stealing th everything, and if, you know, if there was a, you know, anyway, da-da-da. So, you know, I rolled my eyes and looked at my wife, and I said, you know, this may be a big mistake. <laughs> anyway, so uh, we set the cage up down in the sitting room downstairs and, um, and left the door open, and the next day, he didn't sleep in it that night. We put his little bed out on the floor, and he slept in, in or around the bed. And then the next morning, I go down there, and he's walking around in the, you know, downstairs, and he sees that cage. And he walked over there, and he looked at it, and then he went in. And he kind of looked around and sniffed it. And then he came out again, and he's never been in it since. And what I've noticed is that not only has he become a good pal, but he's all, he can also preach. This is the amazing part. This dog can flat out teach you stuff that uh, 
I mean, is really important in the kingdom of God. All kinds of stuff. In the morning, I go downstairs early, early before the sun comes up, and I sit down and I'm praying. I you know, make a cup of coffee and I pray, and Flynn always comes down with me. And um, he stays in prayer for a while. He has a window that he likes to look out of, and I usually open it. Even in the winter, I open it up so he can sniff and smell things. He loves that. And he'll stay in prayer with me for a while. And then, you know, and he can, I can look over there and see that he's kind of like, you know, his prayer is kind of fizzling out. And uh, he'll get off the chair and kind of walk around and throw himself around on the floor a little bit and rub up against things. And then he'll just stand and he'll look at me. I mean, in the kind of the dark, you know, he kind of look at me like this. He's hard to see in the dark, too. And then I say, okay. And he goes, runs up the stairs and he lies down and goes back to sleep. So he's got his limits in prayer, but he's faithful, and he's kind of just hangs in there. <laughs> he he's learned, and he extra, he does this. I mean, this is a routine for him. He he learns that he's got to rest while he can. You know, if you give him a few minutes off, he'll throw himself down on the floor. I mean, really, it's like it's like a, you know, not just. You know, not like a poodle or anything, just boom, he just kind of throws himself down. And it, I think he does it because he knows that he's, he's got to be ready when it's time. You see what I mean? He can preach. It's amazing. You've got to get rest while you can because there's going to be times when you just got to spring up and do what God wants you to do. He takes shortcuts on the trail. We have, uh, we have enough, we have five acres on this hillside where we live. We kind of, my wife and I decided that when we would finally come home from Africa that we wouldn't live behind walls and fences and barbed wire and where we couldn't see anything. So we got a piece of property on a hillside and we can actually see things. It's awesome. And there's enough wooded space on the, on the hill where Flynn and I have carved out some trails and we walk these same trails. We actually call it morning patrol. And we do the perimeter check, you know, make sure we'll kind of check out what critters have been there. And, and there's a lot of interesting sniffs. Well, I mean, he, he does the sniffing. I don't do the sniffing. And, um, but sometimes you know, there's places where when, when we do the same thing every morning, and sometimes he takes a shortcut, you know, just a little shortcut. I don't know why, but he takes a shortcut and gets ahead of me on the trail. Sometimes he gets so far ahead of me that I've got to tell him to stop. And the command actually is wait. And so I'll say, Flynn, wait. I mean, he may be, you know, 50 feet ahead of me. Flynn, wait. And he'll just stop. And then he'll wait. And then I say, okay, go. And then he goes again. He listens. He's ready. I mean, he's, it's like he's on his own. See, he's preaching. It's like he's on his own. But he's always listening for this voice. Wait. Okay, go. Sometimes... Sometimes it gets serious. I mean, we do have coyotes that show up and then other critters, and even a skunk comes by every now and then. Sometimes the command is wait, and then it's followed by come, and he comes back to me. Off the trail, you know, he gets off the trail, he gets in the weeds and the seeds and the burrs and the, you know, the, all that, and he's got to be combed out. I mean, he thinks he looks fine. You know, and we show up at the door and we know the Pat's waiting, you know, and it's time to go into the house. He's got his feet are covered with mud and he's got all these stickers and things and stuck in his coat. He's, he's happy and he looks great, but uh, he doesn't know he needs to be cleaned up, even though he thinks he's just fine. It's amazing how he can preach. He's always posted at some kind of window, almost always. If he's not resting, he's posted at a window guarding and really what he's doing, he's really not protecting us. He's really just making sure that he's safe. He can raise the hackles, you know, on the back of his neck with his ferocious look, you know, and it looks like he's pretty an intimidating creature. But um, in actual fact, um, he just usually the, the threat gets a very nice greeting when they get closer to the house. He loves treats. He wants treats. He can talk me into treats. 
And it's a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous thing for him and for me when he talks me into treats. See, what he's doing is he's preaching. And, uh, you know, Christians across the board seem to have this thing where they really oftentimes are looking for treats. And they think that sometimes they talk God into giving them treats. But God doesn't bend like I do. And it's not that he's, he's not giving us treats for no reason. He may be giving us good, sweet things that we really find needful at the time. But it becomes a dangerous thing if Christians begin to believe that they can talk God into treats. And when, it's, when they're getting a treat and it's not God that's giving them the treat, but they perceive it as God giving them the treat, then they start on this road where they think they're talking God into treats. And they pursue the treats. And sometimes the treats are really bad for you. When Flynn got to our house, he weighed 37 pounds. On our back porch, uh, I built this thing. I mean, you have to have a, you know, a rail on your porch if it's so far off the ground. And so I put up these rails and the, and the whatever, the, the styles or whatever they're called. I don't know. Those things were like, they're like this far apart. And Flynn could squeeze through them. So if he saw a rabbit, he, could, he didn't have to go down to the steps. Go, brrr, you know, he'd just go whew, right through. Just, now he's, last time he was at the vet a few weeks ago, I don't know, there must have been something wrong with the scale. Because he weighed 66 pounds. And he looks good. I mean, don't get me wrong. You know, he, he doesn't run as fast as he used to. And that's true. And he can't squeeze through the thing. <laughs> But he sticks his head through there and looks, you know, and makes him think he can do it. And I think that thing about the cage is amazing, you know. Because he was torn away from a life that he had learned to love, you know, his first 15 months of his life or so. And, uh, and now he's out in the wilderness, you know. And I, I think there was a, I think he learned a certain security in the cage. This is the hard part to preach. I think he learned that there was a certain kind of security having that cage. And I know that dogs do that. I know that, I know that's a modern way of training and all that. I just, I'm, I have no interest in cages and I have no interest in, in that kind of thing. I'm not finding fault with it. I'm just saying that's the way I am. And, you know, we've got this property and let's go look at it, Flynn. Let's go sniff it out, you know. See who's been around. See if there's a perpetrator on the loose on the hill. And, uh, and I know that for him, there was a security in the cage. And he has this thing about thunderstorms. He's terrified of thunderstorms. He's gotten a little bit better. He finds me and he gets close to me. He likes to hide behind things. And he, the perfect scenario is when he's hiding behind something, but I'm right next to the something. It's like perfect security. And I have a feeling that might have been because he was caged at some point where there were thunderstorms raging and he couldn't do anything about the storm. Just trapped. I'd like to go hide. But I can't. And so it reminds him, I think. I think the thunder and the lightning remind him of times when I wanted to escape. I wanted to find a safer place and I was stuck in this, in this thing. That's tough for a Christian. Because we need to learn to operate outside the cage. We have our places of security that we run to, but we don't just stay there. I, you know, I think about that, uh, that scene on the beach at the Sea of Galilee after Jesus' resurrection, after he had told them before, even before his crucifixion, I'll find you, you know, I'll, after these three days, you know, go, I'll find you in Galilee. I'll find you. We'll meet in Galilee. And uh, it was tough on the disciples. They, they locked themselves in a room after the crucifixion. The Bible says for fear of the Jews. They got him. They got our leader. 
we don't even understand. We can't even compute why, why the plan would even include him being arrested and, and humiliated and crucified like this. So what are they going to do with us? He had all power. He could raise the dead. He could heal any kind of sickness. He could have called lightning and fire from heaven, but he never did. And now they've taken him and killed him and stuck him in a tomb. And they're, they're behind a locked room for fear of the Jews. And then the resurrected Christ appears in front of them and says those words, Peace be unto you. That felt good for a while. He kind of poofed himself into the room and now he poofs himself out of the room. And there they are again, without him. They finally remember that he, I, don't, I guess they remembered that he said, I'll find you in Galilee or we'll meet up in Galilee. And so they go to Galilee. But one of the reasons is because at least seven of them were fishermen from Galilee. So it was no big deal for them to head out of Jerusalem and go home and look for a safe place and get comfortable. Peter says those famous words, well, I'm going to go fishing. Instead of I'm going to kneel down here in the sands of the shore and I'm going to pray until Jesus shows up. Doesn't go back to the last thing that the Lord told him to do. Forgets the exhortation of peace being unto them. Doesn't sink his knees into prayer and just says, I'm going to go fishing. I'm going to go back and do what I feel comfortable doing. I'm going to provide the way I know that I can provide. I'm going to live the way that it, it, it's the safest and the most secure. And they fish all night. You know the story. They don't catch anything. In the morning light, they see somebody on the shore who calls out to them, Do you have any meat? Have you caught anything? Well, we haven't caught anything. Well, put your, put your net down on the other side. There comes the fish. Now Simon Peter gets it, jumps in, swims to shore. What does he find? Jesus and a fire and bread and fish. And I can just imagine that morning together with Jesus and how good it must have felt. He's back. <laughs> He's alive. Look at the fish. This is what we thought. This is, you know, who knows what was going through Simon Peter's mind about the fish. I fished all night and look at this. He was here all the time on the beach. Maybe he, did, maybe he did call down fire from heaven that morning and set up this nice breakfast for him. And I can see him lying back in the sand, all happy and satisfied and fulfilled and feeling secure again. But that's not the end of it. Peter, if you love me, then go and feed my sheep. Get out of your comfort zone and go and do what I've actually charged you to do. We still have the cage. It's just up in a loft of our, of, the, of our pole barn. Just, I really should give it away to somebody because I know one thing. Flynn's never going to use it again. And then the other thing that he does, and I don't know the application of this particular thing, but every now and then he sneaks an occasional sock. It's just what he does. You just see him coming along and he'll have this sock in his mouth. Hey, 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 come over here. And he gets down like this and comes over. Drop the sock. He drops it on the floor and then we shake hands and everything's okay. <sighs> Praise God. Just before I left to come down here, you know, the weather is changing. So, uh. He had this huge coat. I mean, he had a, this beautiful black coat that he's been wearing for months. And so I got the razor thing out. Zzz, and, was, bzz, and then he'd walk off. Come back over. Zzz, 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 and then he'd walk over and lie down. It's get over here. And it's, zzz, zzz, zzz. So I took off, I don't know how many pounds of hair. I think he probably might be down to like 50 pounds now. I don't know. And he looks great. I mean, you can, you know, and he still can't go through the thing, though. And uh, so if you're wondering what, where, where this weird haircut that I've got came from, it came from Flynn. Same day, I did him and then I did me and it turned into a horrible mistake. So, uh, you know, it's like one of those things where one side is too short. Well, I'll just even it up from the other side. Okay. Hallelujah. Who's got a Bible? Who's got an electric Bible? Who's got a real Bible? Who's memorized the whole Bible? 
just asking. You know, there's always one somewhere that done the whole thing. The bishop. Somebody said the bishop, you know. Yeah, see, and, and don't tell him this, okay? I tried to have a talk with him about that one time. It was about this, you know, anyway. It was about this note thing. You know, how many notes can one have, you know, as an apostolic preacher? And, and uh, so I, I said, look, brother, you know, one thing you, you, <laughs> thing you got to understand is you've got some kind of memory, you know. I mean, you ever heard him talk about history? I mean, like his life? Well, it was uh, April the 2nd of 1942 when I remember seeing, you know, I thought, what? what? You know, the only people like that I, that I've known are Africans. Africans remember all those dates, too. I mean, it's weird. And usually it's guys that have something against you. <laughs> and uh, say, uh, well, Brother Grossberg, I remember, you know, it was April 2nd, 19th, when you said, so, I said, oh, I said that? Well, yes, you did. And, of course, now I can't defend myself because I can't remember. But they remember it. You said that I was a lunkhead. Well, that sounds like me, but, you know, I, anyway. <laughs> So I'm just convinced that, you know, the bishop can, he's got this thing, he can remember stuff, you know. Of course, I'm sure he just pours over the, you know, the passages like 23 hours a day and uh, remembers this stuff. And I, you know, I, what, if I work on, if I work on a tractor or, you know, if I do the, you know, if I'm changing, you know, the control arms on, a, on our Jeep or something like that, I mean, I, you know, I'll study it for a while and then I'll do it. And then if when, it, you know, two years later when I've got to do it again, I got to go back and restudy it. I mean, some guys can do it one time and they know they can fix any car on the side of the road because they just, they know how, to, you know, not me. I got to keep, re so I got to keep going back and looking at these things and remind myself exactly what it says. And anyway, blah, blah, blah. So who's got the book of Revelation on a Bible or a phone or on the back of your hand or whatever? Revelation chapter number 17. Revelation. You don't hear me preach about Revelation very much because, to me, it's really quite an interesting mystery. I know there are some people that understand it perfectly. Well, that's what they claim, anyway. They understand it perfectly. Uh, let's see, 17. Well, just to make it delightful... Somebody, who wants to read? Somebody can read loud and strong? You can do it? You ready? Wait, what, did you say sure? Tommy Tippy, my man. Read it on, read on, brother. Oh, sorry. Well, I thought you were supposed to feel that in the spirit. <laughs> twelve, twelve. And twelve has nothing to do with what I'm going to say, but I, it's just interesting. Loud. Louder. And the ten horns yeah. which thou saw are ten kings. Now you know who they are, don't you? Okay, go ahead. I mean, that goes without saying. That's the way I teach Revelation. Go ahead. <laughs> There's no need in going in there because you know what it means. Ten keys. Come on. You know, the ten, king, the ten kings represent so that, you know, that, okay, go ahead. You know why I got you laughing is because we're going to get into something later. It isn't going to end like this, I, I tell you, unless Flynn would show up. Okay. No, no, I'll start again. Yeah. Louder. You have a great voice. You have a great voice, too. Start again, start again. And the ten horns which thou are ten kings. I have no clue who they are. Go ahead. Which have received no kingdom as yet. What? Okay. But received power as a king one hour was to be. Whew. Man, I'm glad I've got nothing to say about that. Okay, keep reading. These have one mind. Now. Yeah. Now we're getting to the point. 14. Here we go. These shall make war with the Lamb. Yeah. And the Lamb shall overcome them. Hallelujah. For he is Lord of Lords. Yes. King of kings, and King of Kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. 
No, it's good. Somebody once said that there are many are called and few are chosen. In Revelation 17, we get a glimpse of people that are with the Lord in this victorious triumph over the last day evils. And they are called and they're chosen. Many are called, few are chosen. But these are called and chosen and faithful. And I don't want you to miss the import of that particular expression in Revelation 17. These are people who made it. And now they are part of the throng with the Lord who in, is, is pouring out His wrath on everything that is evil and wrong in and on the earth. I don't, like I said, I don't say too much about Revelation. I, I, I appreciate the, the glimpse of the churches in the first few chapters, you know, and then after that, it's, it's an amazing study and everybody has their ways of doing it. And then the end of it is brilliant. I mean, when we see the city descending from, from heaven, and I just, it's, it's great stuff. But the very opening of Revelation I find fascinating because here's, here's John who, who has this vision. He's in the spirit and he has a vision. And whenever somebody starts telling me all the specifics of the book, I always just tell myself quietly while I'm listening to their secret keys to opening up the book of Revelation, I tell myself it's a vision of John. And who knows exactly? Who knows? We'll see. And all I want to do, all I want to do is be there as it's happening and I want to be on the right team as it's happening. I want to be called and chosen and faithful. I want to see it unfolding before my eyes in one way or the other. The opening of John, is, um, the opening of the, of the book of Revelation is John seeing Jesus like he never saw him before. He hears a voice behind him. He's praying on the Lord's day and he hears this voice. And it's not the, it's not the bleeding of a sheep that he hears. It's not this gentle lamb that he has an encounter with in Revelation chapter 1. All of a sudden, he's backed up by the lion of the tribe of Judah. This God, this, 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 this God who made himself a human being to pay for our sins, who now is operating as the omnipotent Lord of lords and King of kings, the Almighty, the one that was and is and is to come. The first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. That's who he sees. He, he sees his eyes like fire. Looking into his eyes is like looking into pillars of fire. He has this great strength. He has this awesome presence. And that's who, that's who John is looking at. And that's the, that's the Jesus that we're reading about in chapter number 17 when he says that those that were with him are the called and the chosen and the faithful. The called, the chosen, and the faithful. You know, the call is kind of a general, I mean, it kind of represents a general precept in the kingdom of God. Uh, people are called. I mean, Jesus said many are called. The, the, the precept is simply this. God is calling us. There's no way to escape that. If you're going to be part of the kingdom, it's because of a kingdom call. If you're going to really be part of the kingdom, it's because you've answered a kingdom call. I cannot tell you what a privilege it is for me to talk to a group of people like this. I'd rather do this than just about anything in the world. Because the potential for change, the potential for lives being turned around and saved and the people that you can touch and, and uh, you can help them to take the next step in their walk with God. The, the amount that you can grow and, and be, be cultivated by the hands of the, of the, great, uh, the, great, the greatest power there is. God can do anything, to, but He can only do anything through, in and through somebody who gives himself to that, to, give, to that power and that spirit. Anything can happen. It's a journey. Anything can happen. 
You have no idea what's around the next bend. It could, be, it could be horrendous. It could be very, very sad. and It could be, it could be something unimaginable. You can get a call in the night that something terribly tragic has happened and you just and you collapse for a while and you kind of go into a, a shell for two or three days and, and somebody has to come and comfort you. The Lord's hand gets put upon you and then and you get through this thing and you grow through that thing and you learn something through that thing and then you look around the next bend, you, you get around there and it's this glorious thing. And you're covered you're covered in light. You're surrounded by warmth and confidence and boldness and courage and faith. What a journey. What a journey. And if your journey is mundane, then your journey is not real. If it's not exciting, then you haven't, you haven't discovered the secrets of the journey yet. And I'm telling you that you can. And you can become exactly what God wants you to be. You can. Because that's what He does. He's a life changer. There's that chorus that says he's a chain breaker. But only if we let him. I woke up this morning with that simple chorus on my, on my brain that says there's none, there's none like you. I could search the whole world for all of eternity, Lord, and find that there is none like you. We had a French chorus that we sang in the Congo that said, Il n'y a que toi, Jésus, which means there's only you, Jesus. That's what John saw in Revelation. Interestingly enough, you know, after the presentation of this almighty God who's, who's going to pour out his wrath, and, and it's not just wrath for the sake of being mad. It's, he's going to pour out his judgment that has been held back. All these millennia have been held back. Think of what God could have done all through history. All these rebellious people, all these rebellious people, everybody just denying him and acting like he's not there. You know, if you've, if you've heard me say this before, I'm going to say it again. I, you know, I, I feel like, you know, I, I feel like I know what, what Jesus was saying when he was talking about what it means to blaspheme the Holy Ghost. And there's all kinds of discussions. I mean, you can, you can look on the internet and you can talk to people and you can hear preachers, you know, allude to, well, it's probably this, it's some heinous thing, it's, it's denying that God is, is when He's not, and, all, and it's, you know, saying that God did this or God didn't do this. It's just simple to, it's simple to me. It's, go, it's going all the way through your life and just constantly pushing God away from you, blaspheming. Because what's the Holy Ghost? What is the Holy Ghost? It's the Spirit of the Almighty God, but in a, in a certain context. It's the Spirit of God as He works in and through people. It's not just the Savior standing on the side of a road outside of Nazareth and talking to, to a blind person or healing somebody. It's the Spirit of God moving in us and through us and changing us and making us what He's called us to be. That's, that's what the Holy Ghost context is. It's God in man. It's God working in us. And to deny that all through our lives. And to go and to descend into some cruel, cold grave at the end of a, of a good, full life. And having finally denied God for the last time, it's like the greatest blasphemy you could do against God. You've taken everything that He meant for you. And cast it back at His feet. I don't want it. Well, I'll be drinking beer with my friends in hell. I'm afraid you won't. Because the beer's all boiled off by then. Called. We're all called. Everybody in this room is called. And you've done a good thing, I think, by being here. Not because of me, not because of any program, not because of any seminar, but just simply by the fact that 
here we are and we're talking about something that's called leadership and you're either in leadership or you've got, a, you've got this, this little thought and maybe an infant thought right now. It may be, it may be a, something that's like a, like a foreign kind of aspiration for you that maybe one day I can be something like this or like that or I want to do like so and so or I want to grow a little bit more. That's good because what you're doing is you're answering the call. You're here. You're answering a call. You're here. That's how you get chosen. Being chosen actually depends upon us. The call is from God, no question about it. The choice, the chosen part of it, yeah, it, it's from God, but it all hinges upon the way that we answer the call. It's almost as if, and I say this, and people have probably have mistaken it for years in teaching, but, but I believe that we, in a way, we position ourselves for usefulness in the kingdom of God. We position ourselves. I don't mean looking for a position. I don't mean qualifying in some, you know, some scholastic way. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about answering the call. Here, here it is in a nutshell. Life is just a series of decisions. It's just we go from choice to choice to choice to choice every single day of our lives. It's just it's, it's the road splits all the time. Sometimes it splits 20 times in a day. Which, which way are we going to take? Which way are we going to take? Was it Job that said, I mean, in one of his righteous moments, wasn't it Job that said that he knows the way that I take? Well, my question today is, do we know the way that, that he takes? When we get to the junction, which way is God pointing us? Which, look down the road and, you know, where's God in this thing? Where does this one lead? Could it possibly be from God? And won't He make it clear which way to choose if we'll wait on Him? If we'll wait on Him? If we'll position ourselves at the junction and say, God, I'm not taking a step further either way until you show me. Which one is from you? How can I get better? How can I get deeper? How can I get higher? How can I know more? How can I be more useful? How can I do more? How can I be what I hear preached about all the time? I'm tired of staying in one place. I want to move on. That's answering the call. That's how you become one of the chosen. And it doesn't stop there, even though Jesus said many are called, few are chosen. He was making his own point with that. That's true. It's hard for most people. They don't make it. They don't go from the calling to the chosen. They don't make themselves available. They don't position themselves for usefulness. They don't answer the call like they should. So they don't get chosen. But those that do get chosen don't stop there. Because if you're going to be victorious, as in Revelation 17, you've got to be faithful. And if you think this is easy, if you think it's easy, they're taking the easy road, being a leader, you're absolutely mistaken. But I'll tell you what, it's a lot more glorious. And I don't mean glorious for us, I mean glorious for Him. Because you can shine for Jesus if, you, if, you'll, let him, if you'll let Him, if you'll let Him make you one of the chosen, and then you'll just stay faithful. I would do anything for him. Wouldn't you? If he visited you in the night and asked you to do anything, would you deny him? No. No, you wouldn't. So why do we do it every day? In the book of 2 Peter, there's a passage that I just, I mean, I, I adore. I adore Simon Peter's writings. I really do. I don't know what's going on with my nose. I know what's going on with my eyes, but I don't know what's going on with my nose. I've turned into this crybaby. It's ridiculous. I think, was it last night? I think last night I was, you know, talking away to the deacons and deaconesses 
and I, I had a nose drip. And so, I mean, a drip, I mean, a drip out, like a sweat drop out of my nose. My nose was sweating. <laughs> and I just, I, you know, I just, I, boy, I hope nobody saw that. Here I am telling it, you know, so. <laughs> if you did see it, then I know that you know, and you know that I knew. <laughs> Flynn does that too. I mean, when he, after he's done lying down for a while, he pops up, you know, ready to do something. You look down and there's this little drop there. Where, and never, and never mind. Okay. Okay. I'm learning all kinds of things from him. 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter 1. Okay, here's your turn, brother. Lay it on us. Loud and strong. This is one of those meals. 2 Peter chapter 1 is one of those meals you can just chew on for ages to come. From, from, from Simon Peter. Who'd have thunk it? Got to be loud, man. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. A servant and an apostle. I mean, how great is that? It's just awesome. To them that I mean, he could have said an apostle, period. To them that have obtained wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. You're going too fast. I want you to chew on this. Okay, he's a servant and an apostle. Okay, go ahead. To them that have obtained like precious faith. To them that have obtained like precious faith. You know, some people think that 1 Peter was an epistle written to one group and 2 Peter was written to another group, that one group may have been Jewish believers primarily and another one may have been Gentile believers. At any rate, I mean, this, might, this, this kind of alludes, you know, to uh, Gentile believers because now they've become, they've become drawn into this like precious faith. They've received the same kind of faith that we did from the beginning. Go ahead. There you go. And, and the only way that we become part of it is by obtaining His righteousness. We sang a song in the church where we go to last Sunday. I think it was during Easter. I think it was. And, um, you know, of course, I don't know the words to all these new songs. And when they throw them up on the thing, I mean, I'm trying to worship, but I'm also reading and I'm looking for loopholes. I'm looking for, I'm looking for false doctrine. And every now and then I see it. And then I just say, what in the world am I supposed to do with this? You know. It was, uh, it said, I can't remember exactly, but it said basically that, um, that we had become, let's see, how did it say? We, that we have become God's righteousness. And I thought, that it sounds like the exact opposite of the way the Bible describes it. I don't put any righteousness on God. His righteousness is imputed to me by His grace, but through the operation of faith. When I say in my heart, when I live according to my belief, to my faith that says that all of this is the way it is because Christ loved me and because I was lost, I was undone, I was in desperate need of a Savior. And God became flesh so that I could have that opportunity. And I'm, tr I'm going to trust in Him. I'm going to repent of, from my deeds and I'm going, to, I'm going to throw myself at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ and let Him save me to the uttermost. That's faith. That's faith in His sacrifice. And what He does with that is impute His righteousness to me. Read that again. Start at the beginning. Loud. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith. They've obtained like precious faith. They learned about Jesus the way that we learned about God. Okay, and... Through the righteousness of God. They've obtained like precious faith and it all it makes us all one through the righteousness of God. Okay? And our Savior Jesus Christ. 
Yeah, and it's interesting because, and that's the King James. Are you reading King James? Yeah. Well, King, this is one place where King James translators drop the ball. And they're trying to be a little bit Trinitarian here because that was their training. So you got to be careful. And literally, literally what it says, that's very clear. I mean, in the original text, it's very clear. It says, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what it says. <laughs> so there are times when it's nice to, you know, look at other other translations and which will then spark some kind of interest in you to say, well, let's find out what the original text seems to say. And they drop the ball here. OK, two. OK. It's, that's going to get really thick here. This is like the this is like this is like, uh, well, thick like uh, mashed potatoes, but with gravy or chunks of anyway. OK, I, that's a bad description, but it's just, I'm kind of hungry right now. OK. According. According as his divine power. Listen, listen to that. This is amazing. Listen to this. This is the opening. This is the intro. This is like, you know, two uh, people of like precious faith from uh, servant and apostle Simon Peter regarding, do you still use that in business letters, to, from? I did it the other day. I hope it was okay. Anyway, and then, so regarding what? Regarding uh, the divine power that has given to us something. What? His divine power has... This is when you read. I know I'm hard to do this with. Given unto us all things. How, 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 oh, he's given unto us what? Okay, all things, but there's a qualification. See, he won't just give you treats. Because it's by grace. And grace is always giving us what we need in order to carry out his purpose. That's what grace is. We don't deserve it. But he gives it to us to carry out his mission. That's, that's, the exciting, that's one of the exciting parts of the journey. You can expect this stuff. You know, when you go to Africa or when you go to the UK or wherever you, wherever you go. You know, when you go to Spain, when you go to Timbuktu. <clears throat> and you're sent by God. You're in his grace. You'll find everything that you need to be useful. And when push comes to shove and it looks like all hell is breaking loose and what do I do next? Your prayer will go right back to the foundational principle that, hey, God, you sent me here. And now I know you're going to help me. And he will. He absolutely will. And if you're over a small group, and you're wondering what the, what the holdup is, you need to go back to the foundational principle that God puts you here. It's the will of God. Small groups are, 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 were, are, 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 were and are ordained by God to help build the body, and the Lord will help you develop that group. And don't stay static. And I don't care if you got more than all the other groups. Don't stay static. Don't stay, don't get stagnant. Don't compromise. Don't say it's enough. Because your group can grow. And then it can divide up into two. It can spark some new babies. And new groups and new opportunities and new areas. New geographical locations for groups that want to get together and grow saints according to the will of God. Anything can happen. But compromise is not the will of God. And you don't become, you don't, you, don't, you don't exist as a chosen with that kind of attitude. And you're certainly not faithful with harboring those kind of thoughts. It's not right. It's not of God. It's wrong. You've, you're by, according as His divine power has given unto us all things, but not just all things, but all things that pertain to life and godliness. How? Through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue. 
We've got to know Him. You need to read the book. Now, you don't, I mean, you hear that on a regular basis, I think, from the bishop on down through the hierarchy of apostolic church, uh, Antioch, the apostolic church authorities, okay? You hear the need to get in the book and, and look at what it says. Because it's through the knowledge of Him that we gain this perspective and this insight into the working of His kingdom. Read on, four. What I mean, this is this is superlative writing. He's writing in a superlative kind of context here. You're given all things. You're given exceeding great and precious promises. Simon Peter knows this. He was with the Lord. He failed the Lord. He denied the Lord. He cursed the Lord. He tried to do it well on his own. He gave up on the Lord. He fought on the wrong side in the Garden of Gethsemane. He had virtually no knowledge of what was going on. He only had occasional glimpses of insight when he would say wonderful things like, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he had no clue of really, just a few seconds later, when Jesus says, Well, now it's time to go, and I'm going to be crucified. And he says, It's never going to happen, Lord. But when he got filled with the Holy Ghost, he found something that charged him to the nth degree. And a fisherman from Galilee stands up in the middle of, of Acts chapter 2 and preaches a message from all places. From the book of Joel. Give me a break. Where did that come from? You think he memorized Joel from going to synagogue every week and listening to somebody occasionally get out the scroll of Joel and read it? No way. Did he have scrolls at home that he could memorize about Joel? No way. But he was full of the Holy Ghost. Full of the Holy Ghost. He stands up and says, this is that. You think they're drunk? They're not drunk. This is that which was promised. The Christ, the Christ that came to save you is the one you crucified. Well, then what do we do? In one of those Bible studies I was talking to you about last night, the one that's on Thursday, we have a couple that we teach. And uh, I, I, baptized, I baptized her, and then he was baptized like a couple of weeks after that. And uh, they're, they're, they just, he, he, this, guy is like, this guy is like a sponge. He wants to know everything about everything in the Bible. And sometimes when we start studying one thing, I've got to like slow him down. And uh, so, you know, we, we're, now we're going through the book of John. And just because I feel like you, this, this will keep us on track. So we're doing that with them. But uh, he asked me a question bef just before we really got started the other day. And he said, uh, you know, he was talking about the prophets in the Old Testament. And we were again just discussing that a little bit. And then he, he made mention of the fact that this, what a serious, um, what a serious uh, sentence would be passed on those on the false prophets in the Old Testament days. I mean, they could be stoned to death. They could be executed for, for false prophecies. It was guilty. It was worthy of death. And, uh, you know, and, and, and then the question was kind of about, you know, what about today? What do we have today? We've got prophets today, you know, and, and that kind of thing. But we don't stone them to death when they miss it. We don't. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One of them is... Uh, because we don't hold them accountable like we should, and we let them get away with murder, and we're also very forgetful people, and it's also because sometimes these prophecies that come out are a dime a dozen, and some of them are just cheap, and we're very forgiving. But there's something else. In the Old Testament, what did people have for the Word of God. What did they have? They didn't have a phone that had 55 different versions. They went to synagogue and they heard somebody read the law. 
And there was a commandment in that law that told them to, to repeat these things at their homes and to teach their children and to put it on the doorposts. And when they go out and when they come in, they would read some of this law and it would just kind of stick with them. And some of the priests and some of those Pharisee types later on would you know, put on the hems of their garments, they would put little portions of the law. And so they, they, they saw it every now and then. I don't know how many of them could actually read anyway. You know, I think they went to synagogue school and, and I think they were taught from the law and that was it. But no quick copy, no quick reference edition did they have. And when God wanted to speak in an extraordinary manner and bring something to their national attention or to rebuke a certain leader or to promise a certain promise of, uh, in some, some crisis moment in all of Israel, then a prophet would be anointed by God to stand up. And, hit, and a lot of what we read in the Old Testament is their prophecies. And if they were wrong, they could be killed. Because that's all people had. And to stand up and be able to mislead a nation and mislead a people and destroy the call of God in and through Israel, God would have none of that. So don't even think about standing up and prophesying in the Old Testament and just you know, from your own imagination or to make yourself look important and good. But in the New Testament, it's different. In the New Testament church, what do we have? We've got the Word of God. We've got the Word of God. We've got what we call the Bible. It's the written Word of God. We can read what the apostles wrote to the church. We need to know this book so that when a false prophet comes along and tries to mislead us, we can discern between good and evil. We can know that God, that's not consistent with what God says. I know this. And I know what the great and precious promises are because I have learned through the knowledge of Him what those promises consist of and why they're there. Great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. And now it gets absolutely profound. He's going to talk about stuff here that is absolutely profound. Great and precious promises. That by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. What is that? The divine nature. It's the nature of Christ. It's the nature of that, that being called the Savior. The one from Galilee, the one from, from, from born in Bethlehem and raised in Nazareth. This Galilean, this Nazarene. He has a nature about him. There's something that just pours out of him. What was it? It's God released through submission of the flesh to the will of the Almighty, the divine nature. And Simon Peter says that we, that we, that we can be partakers of that same divine nature. Listen, you can't escape that verse. No exclusions there. That's the will of God. That's a principle from the Word of God. That's what works in the kingdom of God. We should be partakers of His divine nature. If we're not on the road to his, getting His divine nature in us, then we're stagnant. We're in the process of backsliding and we don't even know it. having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. And here we go, verses 5 and 6 and 7. Now, does, I've got no proof. I've got no proof. And don't stone me if I'm wrong. I've got no proof that this is an actual succession of the growing in the divine nature, but it just seems to me that is a perfect successive journey that Simon Peter puts in front of them. Besides this, giving all diligence, giving all... You see the superlative here? I mean, he's not playing around. And these are, this, we're, only, we're only this much into his letter. I'm going to write something to the church. It's going to be this long. This is the beginning of it. And boom, here it is. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, Virtue. The ad there is translated by the King James, and you can, you've got your own versions, and you can read it until you're satisfied with the meaning for you. 
But what I've discovered is that it's actually th that verb, add, is talking about a process of one thing springing from another thing. That here is, here is faith. Here is our initial faith in Christ. And springing from that comes the thing that is called virtue. This virtue is really like a moral, it's kind of a moral excellence. It's a commitment to doing what is right. Because of my faith in Christ, because of who He is, because of who He has made me, because of how He's choosing me, by the way that I've, that I've chosen for Him, springing from that faith, is a commitment to a moral purity. A not, not that I'm pure, not that I'm super holy right there, but at least I've got this commitment to living the way that God expects me to live. That's all. Add to your faith virtue. And to virtue what? Knowledge. Knowledge of what? Knowledge of Him. Knowledge of Him. Knowledge of His kingdom. Remember I told you on Thursday night, um, you know, we're going to talk about principles this weekend. And this is a principle. One of the principles is that we need to learn about His kingdom. And as we learn about the kingdom, one of the principles is we'll find principles in the kingdom. God will give us those principles. He'll show us the way it is in His kingdom. If you'll look, if you'll try, if you will spring from your commitment to moral excellence and look in the book and learn of God, He will show you divine principles that work in His kingdom. And what He does is always based on principles. And what we do should always be based on principles. And you could have a whole seminar on that. There's things that are just wrong in the world. And it doesn't take a superhuman spiritual being to realize that what they're missing out on, what they've skipped, is some principle that God created. As stupid as it would be to deny the, the principle of gravity working in the earth. I mean, you know, well, I'm going to climb a tree and walk out to the little skinny branch on the end. Okay, well, go ahead. But you're forgetting a principle. You know, what went up, you know, will soon come down. I mean, we seem to live by that, although I've seen pictures of people doing all kinds of dumb things, you know. And I've been in the airplane, I've been flying an airplane a few times and kind of thought to myself, why did I get myself into this situation? Because <laughs> I'm up and now I've got to get down. But there are principles. And if we do this, it's errant. It's wrong. It won't work. It won't lead to something righteous and good. So add to your, add to your virtue knowledge. And to knowledge what? Temperance. Moderation. Knowing what to do and how much of it to do. Temperance. Learning to, you know, I've got all this knowledge now with, of the kingdom of God. I've got, I got all these principles rolling around in my head. So I'm just going to lay them on the other believers. You know what's wrong with you, brother. You know, you forgot about the principle of, yeah, you know. And, oh, and, oh, oh, yeah, I, I found you out, didn't I? Well, that's not temperance. That's not, you know, it's not just going, you know, rushing through everything. You got to learn to be temperate. My, you know, not, not, not just, you know, not withdrawing or anything, but just, you know, know when to do what to do. Learn how to operate according to being led by the Spirit. And then this one after temperance is amazing. King James calls it patience. It's just, you know, you know talk about misunderstandings. It's perseverance. Add to your temperance, perseverance. So, you've got this faith. And that leads from that springs this, this desire to do what's right according to God. This moral excellence pursuit. 
And from that, you, you spring into a knowledge of Him and the principles in His, in His kingdom. And then you begin to live by those, and you, you're, you're careful about those things and how, how they're used. You're, you're kind of guarding those things. But then it gets even tougher. See, it's, there's, this, there's a progression here. It starts out kind of simple and straightforward, and now we're in this thing called perseverance. So you're going to run into times where, where you're doing something according to temperance and, and knowledge and, and virtue and faith, that just tells you, stop, stop, stop. You can't do this. You can't be this. You can't become this. You can't grow like this. You can't be like somebody else. You can't be higher than you are. You're thinking too much of yourself. Who do you think you are? Stop all this stuff. Or you get sick, or you feel pain, or you're in a problem, or you're in a trial, or everything you know, in, in the devil's kingdom comes against you. And what do you have to do? What do you have to do? You've got to learn. You've got to spring. You've got to spring from temperance into perseverance. And you've got to just stay in the trial. You've got to just stay in the trial. Because if you don't, you'll never learn that you can survive the trial. I don't know how many people have run away from the kingdom of God because they just simply didn't stay in the trial. You never know when the morning is going to break. You don't never know. Well, weeping may endure for a season, but joy comes in the morning. Yeah, which morning? It's not easy getting through some things. Sister Glendon, I mean, you know, I, I don't know. But, I mean, I've admired you from afar for the last several years. Dear Lord, have mercy. Persevering. Loving a man like John. I mean, what a great guy. This guy was the life of every party. He always had something good to say. He always had some happy recollection. And now he's just hammered. I remember at the beginning of all that, well, at least the beginning as far as I knew, because I was off the scene, you know. But uh, I just, you know, I tried to say something comforting. You know, I know it was hard. And John was all just bubbly and everything in those days. Hey, Ted, hey. You know, I remember, you know, tell, tell me about Zambia and all this stuff and, and playing Milbourne in London, you know, on that journey and, Kufri, he would always come up with a Kufri, whatever that was in the game. I've forgotten now. And uh, just robbed. You know, it's like the, it's like the, who knows, the dynamic of that disease. And it just, it just robs, it just kind of slowly pours somebody out almost, you know. You talk about a trial. It's one thing for somebody to die. It's another thing for somebody to die, you know, in front of you every day. It's hard. Thanks for persevering. I wonder how many times Sister Bonnie just secretly and privately wondered Which morning? Which morning? Yeah. This is the uh, divine nature. <laughs> Almighty God. Almighty God. You ever seen somebody throw his weight around? I don't mean like Flynn. I don't mean like that. But I mean somebody in some, some kind of position of authority is, you know, throws his weight around. You have a boss maybe at work that throws his weight around. You know, I mean, they're making out to be like, well, I, you know, I'm the boss. You know, and you're looking at the yeah, I know, I, you're a lone kid, but you have no clue. But you are the boss. You know, you sign this, and you, i got to bring this to you for approval. And, you know, they're just throwing their weight around, you know, thinking there'd be some big shot because they got a position. God Almighty becomes flesh. God Almighty becomes flesh. 
And for 33 and a half years, he walks on these dirty streets in, in, the, in, in Israel and never makes himself out to be some great one. He just serves people at every turn, trying to show them, point them to them to a kingdom that's eternal and will make them fulfilled. And he's spit upon and mocked and treated the wrong way and congratulated for the wrong things, put up on a pedestal when he doesn't want to be put up because they want to build this pedestal for all the wrong reasons. We'll make you a king. And he just leaves town. He just sneaks off. Don't make me a king. It's not my time. You talk about perseverance. And to perseverance, we add godliness. That's an interesting word. I mean, you really, really, you really ought to spend some time looking it up and reading about it and coming up with your own definition. But my, my understanding of it is it's almost, like, it's almost like somebody who simply in all times, in all things, in all circumstances, always has this posture of looking upward. I see everything. I want to see everything from the perspective of God and His kingdom. Because when I look up there, I see in here. Godliness. I consider things. Divine nature. Who am I? Therefore, what do I do? And then, and then after all that, and then after all that. This is, this is what tickles me about this, this passage because we have a lot of messages and a lot of seminars and a lot of remarks made from a lot of pulpits and one person to another about loving our brothers and sisters and there being unity in the church and all that. You know how you get to brotherly kindness? You spring from faith and virtue and knowledge, and temperance, and perseverance, and godliness. And when you get to there, now you can love your brothers and sisters because everybody knows who everybody is. And we're all looking at the same thing. And we're all going to the same place. And we're all trying with the same nature of Christ to be what He's called us to be. And then we can have a seminar on love. And I'm not just talking about filial love, you know. It's always a big deal. We always got to say it's not filial love. It's agape. We're talking about agape. That's, that word's agape there. Well, that word is agape there. And how do you find it? You go through this whole list of things. And you grow in the divine nature of Christ. You want to be a leader? You know what? Last night, I talked to the deacons and deaconesses. I don't know why I always say deaconesses. Anyway. And I, 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 I made a, I made a, a comment about, um, remember the A, for you guys that were there, the A and the B and the C, you know, and we can't, anyway, knowing how we, we were here and we grew to here is important. And we, and we can have no real, where did all these people in the back come from? I don't know. Okay. A to B. You can never have a real, you can never have a real expectation or a real concept or perspective on how much further you can go. Are you, are you hearing me? If you don't know how you got from A to B, then you can't have any real expectation or understanding of how you're going to get from B to C. If you're not growing, you've got a real problem. Because you're, you, you're disqualifying yourself from becoming chosen. Oh, man, I'm just getting like the bishop now. Okay, so, bless his heart. <laughs> love you. Lo love you, man. If I'm, if I'm piped into the house right now, I know it was you who had your hand on my head when I got the Holy Ghost. So I've got only you to blame. Thank you. So, if you're not growing, you've got a real problem. 
So you've got, to t- you've got to sit up and take notice that you're growing or why you're not growing. Last, the, last, the last verse of Peter's second epistle is grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We've got to grow. And if we're not growing, basically we're dying on the vine. It's not right. And, and, and eventually we'll be cut off from the vine. Growing is huge. This is a growth process. So, when I was talking about taking notice of that, how can you how can you know how can you know when you're growing or when you're not growing? Use this passage. Where am I in this list? Where am I in this list? You see what I mean? Faith, okay. Virtue, it's more. Knowledge, more. Temperance, more. Perseverance, that's getting tough, but I'm doing this. Godliness, brotherly kindness, and now agape. Where are you in this? And if you can't find yourself in that, what you're going to have to do is keep going back in those steps until you say, I'm at, least, at least I'm there. But where were you six months ago? I was still there. Where are you now? I'm still there. You're not growing. This is the will of God. Praise God. And the way to agape is not by skipping steps. We all know. We all assent to the fact in these love seminars, (laughs) you know, the importance of lovey-dovey stuff, we all assent that that's, that's right. And, you know, we can't do anything without love. I love, love. You know, we can get John Lennon here and have him sing something about love and we can all agree that that's the way forward, you know. And then I would say, I would slip him a note that say, now sing Imagine so that I can absolutely ridicule you by your stupid lyrics to the word ima- Imagine there's no heaven and no hell below us. Only la 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 la. What a drug head. Give me a break. Imagine all the people. Oh, brother, come on. Come and give me a hug, Yoko. Okay, let's take a break. Stretch yourselves. I got to go practice some more godliness. Get the thoughts of John Lennon out of my head. Take a break and we're really going to get serious, okay?